And good morning and welcome to Holy Family Parish as we gather to celebrate the fifth Sunday of Lent. We welcome all members, guests, and visitors who have come to worship with us today. This special collection is for the Easter flowers. Thank you for your generosity. And now please stand as we sing our praises to God, number 133, Save Your People. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. To prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries, we call to mind our sins and ask the Lord for his forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, and I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault and through my fault and through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, bless Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. pray. Lord our God, by your help we beseech you. May we walk eagerly 
May we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself over to death. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Now call forward the children of the parish. I missed seeing you for the last couple of weeks. You must have been hiding. <laughs> My dear children, you will now go to hear God's word, to praise God in song, and to reflect on the wonderful things God has done for us. We will await your return so that together we may celebrate the Eucharist. the children of God, let them hear the good news. Send forth the children of God, let them hear the good news. Send forth the children of God, let them hear the good news. Send forth the children of God, let them hear the good news. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand to lead them forth from the land of Egypt. For they broke my covenant, and I had to show myself their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer will they have need to teach their friends and relatives how to know the Lord. All from least to greatest shall know me, says the Lord. For I will forgive their evil doing and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. on me, O God, in your goodness, in the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense, thoroughly wash me from my guilt, and of my sin cleanse me. A clean heart create for me, O oh God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. Give me back the joy of your salvation and a willing spirit sustain in me. I will teach transgressors your ways 
and sinners shall return to you. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. In the days when Christ Jesus was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. serves me must follow me, says the Lord. And where I am, there also will my servant be. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Some Greeks who had come to worship at the Passover feast came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servants be. The Father will honor me, whoever serves me. I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it was for this purpose that I came to his hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd there heard it and said it was thunder, but others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered them and said, the voice did not come for my sake, but for yours. Now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this, indicating the kind of death he would die. The Gospel of the Lord. I get two newspapers every day, and what's the one thing that I never not read in the newspaper? The 
comics. To me, they're the most important thing. Whenever I read the newspaper, I read about Beetle Bailey and why he gets beaten up every day by the sergeant. I read about the plugger. The other day, the plugger it says, you're a plugger if, as a man, you go to your dresser drawer and open up a drawer and it's filled with shirts. And the only one you keep pulling out is an ugly green one with the big hole right here. That's your, your plugger. Well, that's me. I love to read the Lockhorns. Hagar the Horrible. Pickles. Did you ever read Pickles? That's a group, I'll tell you. The Family Circle. I love to read it. It only comes on Sunday, though. And it's interesting, most of the time, it's about people who are Catholic. The guy that writes that cartoon is Catholic. So if you're not a Catholic, you might not understand the cartoon. And the list goes on about the different comics that are in there. Well, I read this past week about a man named Michael Heath. He is a cartoonist, and he's from Britain. And one of the cartoons that he drew had this picture. It showed the Lord standing in the midst of all these people surrounding him. And on the side was this one man standing by himself. And he says to one of the Lord's disciples, he says, I wonder, is it possible to see Jesus privately? want to see Jesus privately. Well, what he asked was not an unusual thing in the cartoon. Think about these people from the New Testament. Bartimaeus was born blind, never saw anything, but he could hear. And one of the things he heard one day coming down the road of the street was Jesus of Nazareth. And he heard of what Jesus can do. So he yells out, Son of David, have pity on me. And what did the people standing around say to him? Oh, shut up, he said. Leave him alone, quit raising your voice and create a stir. But what did Bartimaeus do? Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me, he yelled only louder. What does Jesus do? He healed the man. Then you remember a woman who said she had been bleeding for so many years, and she spent all her money on doctors and still was bleeding. So she heard, too, that Jesus was coming. And whenever Jesus is going down the street or the road, it says he's surrounded by all these people. So she figures, I'm going to sneak out because she wasn't allowed to go out of the house because she had blood. She says, if I could just sneak up behind him, grab the hem of his coat or his uh, wardrobe, I could be healed. Well, she sneaks up, and she grabs it, and what happens to her? She is healed. And Jesus turns around and goes, all right, who touched me? You know, what did the apostles say to Jesus? What do you mean, who touched you? There's all kinds of people here. How do we know who touched you? But he found her. And think of this person, a Roman centurion, had no great faith in God, and yet his servant grew sick. So he goes and seeks out who? Jesus. And he says something to Jesus that each one of us will say today, and we know, we know it by heart. When Jesus says he'll come down to the uh, centurion's house, the centurion says to him, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. We say that every time before we go to communion. We're unworthy for the Lord to come down to our house. Well, the centurion's servant was healed. Remember one time Jesus went up to Tyre and Sidon. The best way to explain Tyre and Sidon is if I told you I'm going to go next week in Myrtle Beach. I'm either going to golf or lay around on the beach somewhere. That's what Jesus and his apostles were doing. That's why they went to, up to these places, Tyre and Sidon. As soon as they get there, who do they meet? A woman. And the woman's daughter is sick. She says to Jesus, would you heal my daughter? Do you remember what Jesus said to the woman? He said to her, it's not right to throw the food of children to the dogs. Is he calling her a dog? Interesting way to respond. What does she say to Jesus? That didn't deter her. She said, but even the children throw the old bread on the floor for the dogs to eat. 
why would they throw bread on the floor? It wasn't so much for the dogs to eat. 2,000 years ago, nobody had linen napkins. There were no napkins at all. But they ate with their fingers, which meant your fingers got greasy. But they made a kind of bread, a coarse bread. And they would wipe their hands with the bread. And the bread would soak up the oil or grease. And what would they do with it? Throw it on the floor so the dogs could eat it. Well, when Jesus saw the faith of this woman, what happens to the woman's daughter? She's cured. Then there's this person who probably is the most bold of all the people in the New Testament. It says this man was lame, he couldn't walk. And his friends heard that Jesus was coming into the town. So they built a litter for him. They laid him on it and carried him up to where the Jesus was in this house talking. When they got there, the house was so crowded with people, there's no way they could get in with this man. So what do they do? They crawl up on the roof, they take this man on the roof, dig a hole in the roof, and lower him down to the roof in front of Jesus. What does Jesus do? He doesn't say, oh, how are you? What can I do for you? He says, take up your mat and go home. He was cured. Well, is there any of us who have not asked Jesus to do something for us? We always want Jesus to do something for us. Now, I get to the gospel part. The gospel today is, to me, a very difficult gospel to preach about because it's like two parts, and I don't know which one has to do with the other. At least I cannot figure it out. The first part of the gospel is, it says, Jesus, again, talking, and it says, there are people there, Greeks, who came to worship for the Passover feast. And they hear Jesus talking, and they go to Philip. And they say to Philip, we'd like to go see Jesus. Could we have a private audience with Jesus? Well, Philip probably has never been asked that question before, so what's he do? He goes to Peter's brother, Andrew, and he says to Andrew, these Greeks over here want to go see Jesus. Are they, are they allowed to do that? Well, it says that he and, or he and Andrew... They go to Jesus. And they tell Jesus about these Greeks who want to be able to see him. What does Jesus do? That's the second part of the gospel. It says, Philip went with and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Then it says, and Jesus answered them. What happened to the Greeks? He doesn't say it doesn't say they got to see Jesus or not. Jesus goes into this whole kind of a, a expose of what's about to happen to him. Well, think about next Sunday. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And next Sunday starts Holy Week. And for Christians, it's not a holy day, it's a whole week. It's a celebration of the Lord's death and resurrection. Well, what Jesus is talking about, he's telling people about something. And this is unique what he's going to tell them. Because tradition says Jesus died at the age of 33. I think I've told you, the old church father said, when you die and go to heaven, and you wake up, you'll be 30 years old. So remember what you looked like at 30? You'll be 30 years old in heaven. Well, Jesus begins to unfold something. Now you think he lived for 33 years. His public ministry only lasted three years. What did he do for 30 years? Well, tradition says he worked as a carpenter or as a stonemason. But what was he doing for 30 years? It's easy to figure out. It says when God came to us as Jesus, he put aside his divinity and relied solely on his human humanity. Now think about yourself. Think about a baby in your arms baby over there. What does the baby know about the New Testament? What did you know when you were a couple months old about the New Testament? I didn't even know there was a New Testament at that age. Neither did Jesus. It took 30 years for Jesus to be able to read, study the scriptures, and to get to the point where he says to himself, I am the Messiah. 30 years it took him to figure that out. In three years after that, 
he's going to be crucified. Well, think about the Lord on Holy Thursday. These are the things that happened to him. It says he has the Last Supper with his apostles. Have you ever really looked at that picture, or that piece of marble there? And you find one unique person. Peter usually sits to one side and John's on the other. But who's the person that betrayed Jesus? And you know their name because there's no one in here this morning that has this name. If you imagine naming your child, oh, this is my son Judas. <laughs> no one uses that name. Judas is in there somewhere. In fact, Judas is the first person to ever receive Holy Communion. Once he received Holy Communion, what does he do? He goes out and it says, it is dark. Only in the dark do we do our bad deeds. What does he do? He goes to the Sanhedrin, and for 30 pieces of silver, he said he will point out Jesus so they can arrest him. While Judas is out collecting his 30 pieces of silver, Jesus and the other 11 apostles go to Gethsemane. It says Jesus goes by himself to pray. He takes along with him Peter, James, and John. He kneels there and he's praying all night. One time it says he gets up and goes to look at Peter, James, and John because he wants their support. What are they doing? <clears throat> Sound asleep. Well, he wakes them up and says, can't you stay at least one hour with me? He goes back to praying and says he prays so hard that he sweats blood. And when he goes back again, what's Peter, James, and John and the other disciples doing? <clears throat> By now they're in a deep sleep. Well, who shows up on the scene now? Judas, with, a, with all these guards, armed like they're going to do battle with Jesus. What does, Jesus, what does Judas do to, start, to be able to identify Jesus so they can arrest him? Because you have to realize this is in the dark. There are no street lights in Jerusalem at that time. No lights anywhere. How did the people know that the person they're going to arrest is Jesus? What does Judas do to Jesus? He gives him a kiss. Talk about the kiss of death. Whew. He kissed him, and the soldiers took Jesus away. Well, once Jesus was arrested, what did the 12 apostles do? Remember one time Peter said, when Jesus said, I'll have to die, Peter said, over my dead body, you're not going to die. And no one's going to kill you. What does Peter and all the other apostles do? Shwoop, they're gone. In fact, it says one of them runs away so fast, his garment catches on a bush, and he runs away naked. In fact, they think that's the person who wrote the gospel today, St. John. He ran away naked. Well, Jesus is taken to the Sanhedrin. He's in the courtyard. The, like the room of what I forget what it's called, but outside that room is a courtyard. And guess who's in the courtyard? They're warming themselves by the fire. Who's one of them? Peter's there. And he's trying to warm himself. And it says this young girl says to him, are you from Nazareth? You certainly have that accent. Do you know Jesus? What does Peter say? No, nah, don't know the man. A little bit later, she looks at him again. She says, you sure? You're not from Nazareth and that you don't know Jesus? He said, I tell you, I don't know Jesus. Well, shortly another person, a third person, comes up and says to Jesus, Church of Peter, are you sure you don't know Jesus? You sound you certainly sound like someone from Nazareth. What does Peter say? He says he cursed at the person. He told him he didn't know the man. And he gets up and he walks away out of the courtyard. And when he goes out, beyond the courtyard, what does Peter do? He weeps. A terrible weep because what has he done? He's denied the Lord three times. After Jesus, or after uh, Peter denied the Lord three times, what did Peter hear? Jesus heard it also. cock a doodle do. Remember, Jesus said before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. If you go to Europe, especially at the Vatican, you see statues or paintings of St. Peter, no matter if it's a statue, a painting, or a what, what's always running around Peter's feet? 
a stupid chicken. Can't get rid of that chicken. It's, a big, it's become a symbol in many ways. Well, Jesus is arrested. He's found guilty. And first they tie him to a pillar and beat him with 21 lashes. And from what I can understand, most people never survived the lashings because they used a whip that had pieces of leather on it. And on the end of the leather, they had pieces of metal or stone. So when they beat you, it literally tore your flesh. By rights, Jesus should have bled to death right there. But he doesn't. They take him into the praetorium. And since he claims he's the king of the Jews, what did they give him? A crown of thorns for his crown and a piece of wood for his, sep his staff, his scepter. And when that's all done, they take his cross. He has to take his cross and carry it up to Gethsemane. There they crucify him. And they stand there and they look. One person says, if he's Jesus, the son of God, certainly he can make himself come down off of that cross. Who says that? One of the two thieves. The other thief, which is called now the good thief, he says, why do you poke fun at this man? He has done nothing wrong. He's innocent. We are here because we have killed people. That's why we're here. So he looks at Jesus and he says, Lord, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What does Jesus say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. What he doesn't say, which is one thing I always remember, is what he didn't say. He doesn't say to Peter, to this good thief, he says, well, you're going to have to go to purgatory for at least three centuries to make up for your bad deeds. No, what's he say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. Now that's stuck in my mind because I'm praying the same thing happens to me. When I die and close my eyes, next time I open them, I'm going to see the Lord. I'm going to be in heaven. I'm not going to be too concerned with the purgatory or hell. Every time I think of the devil, in fact, I know I've told you this story. There was a lady called me up one time, wanted me to bless her home. Because she said that she thinks the devil's in her house. Well, I went to this house, and she said to me, what are you going to do if you meet the devil in one of the rooms? Without even thinking, I said to her, I'm going to tell him to go to hell. That's where he belongs. Well, if he went, he must have gone there, because I didn't meet him, that's for sure. Well, is it possible for you and I to meet Jesus? Have you ever met Jesus? I mean, the real, you know, the person, two legs, two arms. Have you ever met him? You don't have to. He has come to meet you and to meet me. What he has done is through his death and resurrection, he has sent to us a piece of himself, the Father. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. In fact, the first reading says, I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. What's the law of God that's written in our hearts? Love God with your heart and your soul and your mind, your neighbor as yourself. And who's the third person you got to love? Your enemy. I mean, <laughs> being a Christian is tough enough, but now I got to love my enemy too. It's like, Give me a break, but that's what the Lord wants us to do. So in this coming next week, starting with Palm Sunday, I pray that you are able to attend some of those services because walking with the Lord during that Holy Week, you go through all kinds of emotions. There's Holy Saturday or Holy Thursday, washing of the feet, the transferring of the Eucharist, the altar of repose. Spending the night in church, some people do, like the Lord did in Gethsemane. Good Friday, we go with the Lord on the walk to Calvary. We come here, we venerate the cross, listen to the Passion. And when you leave on Good Friday, do you, know what, do you remember what the last song is when you leave church on Good Friday? This is the name of that song. There is no song. You just leave. And it kind of puts you in like, oh my. It puts you in a mood to realize that Jesus had been crucified. And Holy Saturday, we're not quite sure what to do because the Lord is in the tomb 
And what does the Lord do on Holy Saturday? This is interesting to know. Read it, and we said, we're going to say it in a little bit of the apostles. He rose, before he rose from the dead, he descended where? He descended into hell. Why'd you go to hell? That's where everybody is. The gates of heaven were closed. It is through his death and resurrection that the gates were open. So when the Lord, we don't see it in our paintings and pictures, but go to a Byzantine church and see an icon of the resurrection. Oh my God, there's all kinds of people going with him, all the saints in the Old Testament. In fact, who were the first two people that the Lord takes out of, out of hell? Adam and Eve. You ever see the old crosses? I don't know if we have one here like that or not. There's an angel up there. The old cross at the bottom of the cross is always skull bones and a, bones and a skull. And a Byzantine, an Orthodox church, those are whose bones? Adam and Eve's. So the Lord has opened the gates of heaven and takes this whole horde of people with him. So on Easter Sunday morning, it doesn't matter if you go to church or don't go to church. It doesn't matter if you believe or don't believe. When you get up on Easter Sunday morning, you feel what? just feel like all the things that happened in Holy Week are now past. Christ has risen from the dead. It's time to celebrate. It's time to get out the ham, the kibbutzi, and the 400 chocolate Easter eggs that you keep in your house. The Lord wants to be with us. That's for the purpose of the whole thing. Now, why John put these two different things together in this gospel, I don't know, because none of us have any idea if this poor Greeks ever got to see Jesus or not. But we know that the Lord dwells with us. He lives in our heart. And it is in our heart. How do we know that the Lord is in our heart? You actually know the answer to that too. You might just never think about it. You have the ability to love. You have the ability to love. That's God dwelling within us. That's God's law. It's written on our hearts. So I pray over these next two weeks, but you may not see Jesus as Peter, not Peter, yeah, Peter did, Andrew did. Paul never saw Jesus. I pray that you're able to experience the Lord because the Lord dwells with us. He's in our heart. And every time you love someone, something, God is revealing himself to the world. If any of that makes sense. How do you know who Judas is in that picture? You get some time, come up and take a look. And you'll be able to see Judas. And he's got something that nobody else has. Together we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. For us and for our innovation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is adored and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. 
I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead, and life of the world to come. Amen. Let us offer up our prayers and supplications to God through Jesus, who has become the source of our eternal salvation. Our response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For increased vocations to the diverse ministries which give life and abundance to the church, we pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For civil authorities who, through prayer and meditation, grow to value the enduring power of loving charity, we pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For sincere willingness to turn from condemnation and grow in charity, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. For our catechumen and candidates, that God open their hearts to the work of ongoing conversation, we pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. For all who are sick, especially those listed in our church bulletin, we pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For our beloved dead, especially Darlene Danko, May she find rest and peace, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. During this Mass, we remember in a particular way, Patrick H. Mahady, we pray. Lord, Lord hear our, our prayer. For all the prayers that we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. O oh, saving Christ, you obeyed your Father in everything and were raised up for the salvation of the world. May we follow you in everything, rejecting what is evil and holding fast to, to that which leads us to life with you, who live and reign forever and ever. And join us in singing Shelter Me, O God, number 479.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Almighty God, hear us, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, gloriously purify them by the working of this sacrifice. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For you have given your children a sacred time for the renewing and the purifying of their hearts, that freed from disordered affections, they may so deal with the things of this passing world as to hold rather to the things that eternally endure. And so with all the angels and saints, we praise you as without end we acclaim. indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, <coughs> Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. A mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Larry, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. In a special way, we pray for those for whom this Mass is being offered and for all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life. 
and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. With Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
body of Christ. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. Blood of Christ. And please join us in singing Unless a Grain of Wheat, number 504.
I leave with you my peace I give to you peace which the world cannot give is my gift unless a grain of wheat shall fall upon the ground and die it remains Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that we may always be counted among the members of Christ, in whose body and blood we have communion. 
who lives and reigns forever and ever. Bless your people, O Lord, who long for the gift of your mercy, and grant that what at your prompting they desire, they may receive by your generous gift, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love God and your neighbor. A quick announcement, there will be a continental breakfast following Mass in the social hall. And we will be singing, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, number 455. at the opening 